Hello and welcome back to another Blu-ray review and in this installment we are talking about another Masters of Cinema release from Eureka. This is spy number 278 in the collection and this film is from 1964. It is Japanese and was directed by Tadashi Imai and that film is Revenge. Revenge is a dish best served outnumbered six to one. So this film I was very much looking forward to checking out because it's a, it's a samurai film and it's Japanese, it's from the 60s, it's in black and white. All those elements seem to come together at a certain point in the, in the history of Japanese cinema to make some of the best films in Japanese cinema and world cinema as, as a whole. You talk about the works of Kurosawa, you know, even things like Harakiri by Masaki Kobayashi, and then there are other ones which I haven't watched including this one, and this is where we get to that kind of uh, interesting middle ground. This film does not have a Wikipedia page, uh, and I think that um, the film is a little bit undersold, even in the extras, and we'll get to that, but we're going to talk about the film itself first, and I just love this artwork um, by Tony Stella. It's absolutely incredible. That's just... It's a stunning piece of work. For a great film, I think. I think this is a great film. I think this is... Um, an underlooked gem, and the fact that it's got a release from Eureka in the MOC line makes me very happy indeed. It over-delivered on what I was expecting and hoping from it. So Revenge, or could also be translated as Vendetta or Vengeance, um, it's about this uh, this young man who, who is kind of a, a low-ranking samurai. He's um, a guard, and he is... Um, He's disregarded by someone who's a little bit higher on the ladder than he is in a, in a public forum. Uh, he gets into a petty dispute with a man called Mago Deu Okuno. And he, instead of doing the right thing and, and putting his head down and, and eating shit from this guy, he talks back. And Okuno is not happy about this whatsoever, so he challenges Shinpachi to a private duel, which is against the code. And so they have this private duel, they settle their differences, but because of the manner in which it was taken and, and the, the way that it was done, uh, Shinpachi is exiled from his community. And they try to uh, rash, rationalize this as Shinpachi lost his mind, like he went completely crazy and agreed to do this duel. And that's the reason that he, you know, broke the law, basically. Because otherwise, Shinpachi would basically have ruined his family's name. And, you know, the, we see in this film how much importance is placed on your family, your family's name, your reputation. And if any one person in your family does something that's out of, out of line, they step over that line, then the whole family suffers um, gravely because of that. And Shinpachi, he agrees to um, this idea that he's insane. He's clinically insane, and so he has to be exiled, and he goes into the mountains to live um, with the Buddhist, who uh, takes him under his wing. And I love the Buddhist character. The actor was really good, and just the way that he, um, kind of to other people, would, would act very disparagingly towards Shinpachi, like, oh, that crazy guy is such a hassle, you know? But you can tell... When you, if you read between the lines, that he he kind of did kind of grow to care for Shinpachi, or at least um, um, grow fond of him, especially in like the one of the final scenes they have together. And he says, "I wish you could have stayed for summer." Um, but I, yeah, I liked it. it was it wasn't overly sentimentalized, but I, I liked the kind of I guess I guess I liked the idea of the relationship between Shinpachi and the monk more than it actually was shown on screen because it is kind of you you fill in the gaps because we see a lot of scenes with the monk. Not a lot of scenes with the monk and Shinpachi. Now, the actor who plays this this central character, uh, Kinosuke Nakamura, uh, he he even gets kind of uh, <laughs> a little bit of not criticism, but he's he's not exactly bigged up in the extras on this disc as being a particularly great actor. But well, I thought he did a very good job with a with a very layered character, to to say the least. But what I loved about this film. Um, well, first and foremost is the way that it was told structurally. Um, we have a kind of Tarantino effect going on here where we begin at the very beginning of the film with the building of this kind of makeshift um, arena out of like bamboo sticks. So they build this big circular fence that encloses a certain area where this duel is going to take place. 
So what's happening is Shinpachi is coming back from exile to his to his hometown um, to fight in a government sanctioned you know a duel that will settle the, the whole score basically. Um, and he's fighting for his for his own honor, his family's honor, and uh, he's also fighting someone who he's wronged. And so he's you know there's there's a whole lot going into the the reason for this duel taking place. But unlike the one that sets the whole story in motion, it's an officially sanctioned duel. And so the whole movie is building towards it. And in our present timeline, we follow the entire day of the duel from literally dawn when the, the local, you know, kind of workers and laborers are, are building the fence right until like midnight, early hours of the next morning. So we see that this full 24 hours experience of this, this kind of, uh, um, this incident, this duel, and then the rest of the film, the majority is told through flashbacks and we keep going back and forth and kind of seeing, and, and it's really well layered. And this was written by an incredible screenwriter who has credits to his name, like Seven Samurai, <laughs> like the greatest film ever made, you know, Rashomon, um, Hadakiri, like these incredible stories that are told on screen. And this screenwriter, whose name is uh, Shinobu Hashimoto, you know, it's, it's an incredible resume, but like, it really feels elevated by the way that it's told. But even the way this film is shot feels like one of the great masters made it. You know, and Tadashi Amai is a director who gets covered in some of the extras on the disc and stuff, but it's a name I'd never heard before. And they, they talk about that and why that might be. And But I just thought that this was, it re again, over-delivered in terms of just how good of a film it was. The, the way it was shot, there's a lot of interesting moving camera stuff when we have the duels in the film, and also just the writing and the layering of these flashbacks, which really form the main part of the story because we, we and it, it reminded me of Had Hadakiri in that, in that sense because that film is also focusing on one specific um, small period of time, and then the majority of the movie is is going back to these chunks of all the events that led towards it. And it's a great way to tell a story, I think, and it's done very well here. So we get little glimpses, and our hand isn't held too much in terms of all the information being given out, but I love how every flashback, every scene was adding another piece of context to, oh, so that's why that, you know, and I really like that. You really have to keep up, though, because there's a lot of characters, a lot of moving parts, and one thing I also enjoyed was the hierarchy. Um on display in the film in terms of uh, the, the certain <laughs> levels of authority. So you'd have like a man who, and I don't know the character's name or the actor, but he was quite a memorable um, part of the film. He always has this kind of smug, sly grin on his face. Even when talking about, you know, people who've been mortally wounded, he's, he's, he's got a fairly devious smile on his face. But we see him acting very cold and authoritative against other characters. And he's the one laying down the law and then you see him going off and sniveling to his boss, you know? <laughs> so I liked how you saw the various levels. Like there's always someone above you. You've got to eat shit from, not to use the eat shit um, analogy more than once in a video, but you know, there's, there's a very select elite few at the top of the chain in this world who don't have to answer to anybody else. <laughs> Otherwise the majority of this world, the majority of society, there's, there's always a bigger fish, right? And I like how that was displayed in this film, but and goes again to like the initial dispute in which these two kind of, you know, lower on the ladder samurai guards, you know, one was a bit more stately than the other, but nevertheless got into this, this petty dispute, which, which spiraled into blood and chaos and revenge and all this kind of stuff. It's even said in the film, like, you know, it, it's, it's hard to believe that all this, you know, there's this big duel and the arena being built. It's hard, hard to believe that all this came from such a, you know, a nothing kind of argument, but that's kind of the way things go. And this is something that I really um, think about a lot, and that is the failures of, of, of our society, not even modern society, but society as a whole, the intelligent society of mankind, right? I'm going to get into it here. I, I do think that at one point, you know, way back when, in the early development of our, our species, of our race, of, of humanity, there was a point in time where one one person wanted what someone else had and thought to themselves, why don't I just take it? You know, why don't I just attack him and take it? And I'm sure that before intelligence had fully developed, there was those kind of the more primal aspect of, of fighting and all that kind of stuff. So maybe that was the violence is, is built in as it is in the animal kingdom. But 
you know, once civilized society came about, there must have been this this switch, this turning point. There must have been that one person who decided that I want to act on this feeling I have of greed, you know, and then there, were, there must have been the first person who decided, like, I, I'm better than that person because of what I have. And so then pride, honor, greed, all those things that cause all the problems in this world, all the problems that have ever existed, wars, millions of people who've died because of greed, because of pride, you know, and sense of, of the ownership and bigotry and all that kind of stuff. It's just so fascinating to me. And I love it when a film like this shows you that like, okay, this big incident and all, all this bloodshed and the destruction of this family and stuff all comes from this one guy who goes, huh, the, these blades aren't very, aren't very shiny. You know, you can tell these guys are slacking off on cleaning them. And another, another guy's like, well, no, actually, if you just give it a quick wipe, it'll be good, good as new. And the other guy goes, what did you just say to me? You know, and that's all it takes. And then it just all spirals out from the, the threads already start to grow. And I find that fascinating. And seeing it in a film like this, I just think is really interesting and just speaks to the, the, hub, the hubris of um, our kind, basically. So it's just one of those ironic things. And it also speaks to the injustices of the Bushido code, which was, and I was reading about this in the book, that was fascinating stuff about how the, the, the Bushido code, um, the kind of samurai kind of code of honor, um, in some ways was put in place or was strengthened around a certain period in Japan's history when I think it was the, the Edo period when a certain shogunate took over everything and just absolutely dominated the entire country, you know, blocked off the borders, like everything is running through their shogunate to the point where samurai aren't really needed anymore. And so the Bushido code was something to kind of give them something to feel honorable about. And this idea of um, death being inevitability and to, to, to fight every fight as if it's your last and everything. And so that's examined in this film, the, the kind of the shallowness of it and how it's it's all about pride and honor, but not really. You know, when when there's a guy above you, you know, is there real honor in that as as a warrior when you're gonna go one on one with this this other man and you're gonna settle your differences, only you're gonna do it in a cheap, unfair way because the boss says so. I love all that stuff and it's again explored brilliantly in this film, I thought. So I did really like the central performance from uh, Kinosuke Nakamura. It gradually becomes more feral and kind of primal as he reaches more desperate parts in his journey. And one thing that I, and I feel like I'm saying that a lot, and one thing, because there are many things in this film that I thought were great, but I love how the the art of the duel, the cinematic duel is explored in this film. And I'm toying with the idea of making a little mini video essay about this because I feel like as much as I enjoy the extras on this release, I feel like none of them really talk about this film specifically. <laughs> And so I almost feel like making like the lost special feature for revenge, you know, the, the, the bootleg Luke Ryan version and making a little mini video essay about the art of the duel as presented in this film. Cause the cinematic duel is a device that's so, um, well, inherently cinematic, but just like visual psychological. And there are three distinct duels in revenge that I think are so interesting because they're also different. The first one is the duel that sets off the whole story, which is Shinpachi meeting with uh, uh, Magudeo Okuno to have their private duel. And you don't see it. You don't see that duel, but it's still a part of the story. And so there's a very interesting way of telling a story by not showing this important incident. And that leads you to think certain things about the main character. You know, how, how did he deal with that when we didn't see how he... Um, acted in that duel. We don't know how competent he was. We don't know the specifics of what went down other than the condition that he's left in afterwards. That's a clue. So the first duel is is just like the intrigue. The second duel is <sighs> incredible. And and it's, and there's a, a very famous Japanese actor who plays the opponent in this duel. And he is the, um, the older brother of uh, Okuno, his character's name is Shumei, so Shumei Okuno, and he's played by the actor Tetsuru Tanba, who is like, you. if you've seen a Japanese film for a certain period of time, you've seen him. I think he's in one of the James Bond movies, he's, he's a very famous, you know, you just, I just see his face and I recognize him and everything that I see him in. But he plays this very cool, calm, collected samurai, and his duel 
is so interesting because his opponent is is really like rattled by the duel. At first, he seems like he's got it, but and there's three like exchanges in that duel, right? And and so it it shows you that the duel isn't always about like fancy cinematography and like how many times someone can flip around or whatever. It's about the psychology of it. And the psychology of this one was that he he smoked his opponent psychologically. You know, that they're getting ready with their swords. They have an initial clash. And his opponent is just destroyed mentally after that and just turns into a quivering mess. And then there are two more exchanges. And the way it ends is completely unexpected and felt realistic. It felt like something that probably would happen, which you don't often get in these kinds of duels in samurai movies where it's, it's very theatrical and kind of you know, a more stylized version of what you'd expect the sword fight to actually look like in real life. This felt like it could actually feasibly have happened in that, in that way. So that's the second duel. The third one is the one that we're building to throughout the whole movie. And you think it's going to be Shinpachi against this, um, this character who he has ties to, and there's a complex history there as well, which was explored very briefly. And I love that little tease and more intrigue going on. But finally we get to this final duel and it's not what you're expecting at all. And right at the end, the, the rug is pulled out from you and Shinpachi himself when um, you, you realize it's not all is as it seems. And the final duel is like, and my breath was like taken. I was so invested in this. It was just like, you know, I felt like I was there almost. I was so like, you know, breath courts kind of just like, oh my God, like edge of my seat. And that is another completely different kind of duel altogether. But it was um, it was just so gripping, you know. And so I think it was a fantastic film. I really do. And I think on rewatch, I'll probably enjoy it even more. My only issue is that it was it was difficult to fully get behind Shinpachi, which is fine because you don't, you don't always have to get behind your, your lead character. But at a certain point in the film, he's visited by his potential future wife, um, Ritsu, is played by the actress Yoshiko Mita. And, you know, there's an idea floated that they'll run off together and stuff, but he knows that he'll be hunted down if he leaves and he's expected to do what they want him to do. And he also realizes that because of the, what, the things that he's done, um, it would be bad for her if they married. And so she visits him one last time, Ritsu, and uh, it's a very interesting final meeting between the two of them because um, he's a broken man at that point. And she can see that and she can sense it. And there's a, a point where she kind of just turns away from him in a way that you can tell that it almost hurts her to look at him. And she's now afraid of him. And you can imagine someone who you once loved is now someone that you fear. It's a very heartbreaking thing. But then... <sighs> Um, he basically forces himself upon her. And, you know, the idea is that he hasn't been with her for months, I suppose, and that's kind of the... It reminded me of a similar kind of very sad scene in the film uh, Midnight Express. Um, but that's kind of... That's that's very different at the same time. But you, you, it's like this desperate lust that he has. And so he kind of drags her into the barn, and we just, the camera just settles outside the, outside the building, and we just hear her protesting no... And so he rapes her, right? And then afterwards, you know, she's all like, yeah, we'll make it work and I'll, I'll, I'll convince my father. That, and it just felt really grimy, you know? And I don't know if it was really meant to be this kind of making us hate this character, but I certainly just, you know, th th there's nothing that excuses that. And probably at the time, I would imagine it wasn't something that's meant to be this morally uh, conflicting thing for the audience. And so it's just like, ah, oh, wow, really? So that kind of change things somewhat but he does devolve i think as the film goes on into more of this animal in a way which makes the final duel even more unpredictable and um and exciting you know it, it is an exciting final showdown and um lots of things going on lots of characters and yeah i thought it was a phenomenal film uh just that one part maybe kind of caught me a little bit there's some great cinematography. There's some great like location stuff, like some really beautiful locations they filmed in. But there's also a mix of like set stuff. Like you can see, there's a fairly extensive set built for the the place where he stays with the monk. And I kind of like the aesthetic of kind of the the old kind of sets on like black and white samurai movies. There's something about them, but I like that there was a mix at least. And certainly the the duel arena was on location, which really helps that big final chunk of the film.
that's that's it. That's that's pretty much all I have to say. I just think that it was uh, I just loved it. I really did love it. So we'll get to the the extras now and just take another look at this slipcover, which is just gorgeous. Again, you see on the the front there with the blood running down his face, Shinpachi Azaki, the lead character. To his right there, you see uh, Shume Okuno, played by uh, Tetsuro Tamba, and. Um, yeah, so uh, just great artwork by Tony Stella. As always, on the inside, it is the same, um, which is fine by me because I think it's a really striking piece. I know some people are fussy about what they get on the at the inside, whether it's a reversible sleeve or not. The inside there. And the extras, um, I mean, well, I guess I should say that the, the transfer, I think, looks really good. It was a 2K restoration. Um, for me, on the on the, the big TV, it looked great, especially some of that those landscape shots and stuff, and even the finer detail on the close-ups, um, which are very dramatic at times in this film. I thought that the transfer looked really good. But there are two pieces, two video pieces. One is Tony Raines on Tadashi and Maya's Revenge. And um, he talks about the, the politics of uh, Imai himself as a director when he was starting out, the fact that he made a lot of propaganda films during World War II, and how later on in life, uh, Tadashi and Mai deeply regretted making those propaganda films during the war. Um, but, you know, it seems like Tony Raines had very little interest in talking about the film Revenge itself specifically. Um, more about the broader career of Tadashi and Mai and also um, Toei as a studio. And the films that they were making, which were kind of um, cheaper and quicker and, you know, kind of uh, exploitative and... And then they kind of tried to do this prestige picture and kind of get international success with a, a serious kind of um, samurai movie with a bit more, um, you know, budget behind it, perhaps. Um, but it's very good. Tony Raines is always interesting to listen to, but he didn't really talk about the actual film itself that much. Similarly with Jasper Sharp, who um, who put together something for this as well. And in his one, he talks about um, Tadashi Amai's career a little bit more extensively highlights uh, many of the films that he made and some of the plot summaries of those. Um, but I mean, I, I feel like revenge got about 20 seconds at the end of the video and it just, they don't really talk about revenge that much. And maybe it's because it, they're not that big on it. Uh, maybe no one is that big on it. I don't know, but it's, um, it's more about the director himself, which I'm, I'm fine with. I'm all, all for hearing more about a director, but um, I do think that it, you know, it maybe could have had a bit more about the film itself and they more talk about Tadashi Amai's politics and how his his earlier kind of political views might have played against his standing um, in kind of uh, you know the the mental image of of world cinema and Japanese cinema and why he isn't regarded among some of the other greats because of his political leanings, which I can't even remember what they were now. So it's um, yeah, I'm not I'm not entirely again. I I do wish there'd been a bit more about the film itself, Revenge. Um, but the booklet was fascinating to me because the booklet um, is a piece by, I think it's Tom Mez. It is called Tadashi Amai's Cruel Tales of Bushido. Yeah, so this one is, you know, you get some nice kind of images in there and stuff. There's a poster and uh, a couple of different posters, actually. But I thought this was a fascinating essay that is, again, less about the <laughs> film Revenge than it is about... Um, the history of Japan and the Bushido Code and the Edo period. But I thought that was fascinating. I really enjoyed what he had to say about it and kind of going into the, uh, oh, what was the, the, the Tokugawa um, shogunate and the, the takeover and that stuff I just find endlessly kind of fascinating um, and how it relates to the Bushido Code that is examined in the film Revenge, but um, again, it is more about the, the history of it and stuff as opposed to um, actual stuff about the movie. And again, Wikipedia page doesn't exist for this film. It's not one that's talked about very much. And Tom Mez also goes into how you, you basically have almost like all or nothing with how people view Japanese cinema. And it's either you have the heavy hitting Kurosawa, you know, Kobayashi, Ozu, all those kind of big name kind of well-regarded directors and then you just have the bottom of the barrel like exploitation style like yakuza movies and samurai stuff cheap fare and there's no middle ground and that tadashi and Mai's revenge is kind of a key part of that middle ground but he doesn't really go into why <laughs> so so i don't know i i think that it's underrepresented even within its own extras but 
The film itself is phenomenal, and I would highly recommend it to anyone to check it out. It's um, it's a great samurai film, and that final duel, whew, that's one to go back to. That's one I might go back to just to watch that final like ten minutes again, and uh, really good performances and. Uh, yeah, there's, I just I know, really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's really, really good stuff. And uh, definitely entered, um, I don't know, because there's there's so many great films in the collection, but I'd probably put it in the upper half of my favorites in the MOC collection because it's just a really strong film. And again, I'm toying with the idea of making like a little video essay about the duels in the film and going into more detail and stuff. And I don't know, I kind of, it's kind of like a, a, a cool pipe dream that I could one day create an extra for a Blu-ray or something or write something for a booklet, um, which is probably reaching far too um, higher than I should. But, you know, it's um, for films like this, I feel like I have the passion for it. But, you know, it's, uh, there's not much more else to say, really. Yeah, I feel like I brought a lot of passion to this review, but I kind of lost my way a little bit somewhere along <laughs> along the way one little weird connection there's a shot in the film of just like the trees swaying in the wind and instantly in my head i just thought something about these trees <laughs> gotta find out what kind of trees these are called douglas firs smell those douglas firs <laughs> but it's like an exact shot from twin peaks almost with the, the just the, the trees swaying in the wind and yeah there's some there's some really great stuff in this in this movie and uh I'd like to see more people talking about it, more people uh, getting into it, and you know, because I think it has a lot to say about um, the cinematic duel, and a lot to say about hierarchy, a lot to say about pride and honor and greed. Like, there's a lot of very interesting things in this film that you can pretty much mirror with today's society, which I, th I think is really interesting. And then on its own, it's just a really well told. Um, film with a broken kind of um, structure. I think it was Tony Raines who said that the film is told in a linear fashion. I thought, no, it isn't. Like, <laughs> it's, it's non-linear. Like, it starts, you know, and he says that, you know, we follow the, the duel as it progresses. We, we don't. We, we go back and forth. We even go back and forth to the point where it's not even a linear going back and forth. Like, there'll be times where we go back, but it's a different time period, which you can tell by the, the facial hair of Shinpachi. Because in some scenes we'll go back and he's got the full beard and he's a bit more ragged and the, the the bald spot on the top of his head has grown out. And then it'll be clean shaven again. And you think, okay, now we're getting closer to the present timeline. No, then we go back to him with the beard. So like it jumps around and stuff, but it still, it demands your attention in a way that I think uh, really rewards you if you, if you if you keep in line with everything. And uh, and I certainly did and just thought that it was, it was phenomenal. So that's all I've got to say, I guess, about revenge for for risk of waffling on for another 30 minutes. So thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one.